Hello and welcome everybody to this uh, program. And um, in this podcast, we talk to people uh, all over the world who are all committed to promoting peace. And especially we're talking to people who are promoting peace in Ukraine. And today I'm very honored uh, that we have as a, as a guest, Jeffrey Sachs, a renowned scholar and university professor at Columbia University. Uh, and someone who has a deep knowledge of economies worldwide. He has worked with governments worldwide in order to promote economic development and uh, counter poverty. Um, and actually, we're very happy, uh, I'm personally very happy that someone like you, uh, Mr. Sachs, Professor Sachs, as a mainstream voice, um, are co contributing so much actually to the, the narrative of peace. So thank you very much for joining our discussion today. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you. Let's let's make some peace. <laughs> yes, let's make some peace. Thank you very much. Um, so let's jump right into it. Can I ask you, how who do you see as the prime actors behind this conflict? Who are they, and what do they want? What do, what do they want to accomplish by by pushing this war? Well, I think the prime actor in this conflict uh, over the last thirty years uh, is the United States which has sought to expand uh, the domain of uh, American uh, military power and political power around the world since the end of the Soviet Union. And uh, the way that uh, it has done this in the European context has been through the expansion of NATO. Uh, this entire approach was deeply ill-advised. And indeed, when President uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in 1989 and 90 told his counterparts, uh, President uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, and uh, Chancellor Helmut Kohl that Gorbachev desired to uh, end the Warsaw Pact military alliance. He was assured by the Americans first and the Germans uh, that uh, they would not take advantage of that. Uh, and the famous expression was that NATO would not move one inch eastward. Uh, an affirmation given by James Baker III, uh, who was the U.S. Secretary of State. Uh, when the Soviet Union ended, uh, the U.S. Uh, security state decided that it was the unipolar world. Uh, the U.S. Uh, prided itself on being the most powerful nation in the history of the world. Uh, it made uh, vulgar and flagrant self-congratulatory uh, remarks about the great colossus, about uh, bigger than the Roman Empire, you name it. But uh, the decision was made uh, in 1992 inside, privately, secretly, without the American people being a party to this, that NATO uh, should uh, expand to fill uh, this uh, space. And uh, the debate raged inside the US in the 1990s experienced wise senior diplomats like Jack Matlock, who was the US ambassador to Russia, like George Kennan, no less, our great scholar statesman who had started the containment policy in 1947 vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, but did not want it to be a militarized containment policy. Uh, and many others said, don't expand NATO. This is dangerous. This will just keep the Cold War going. It will brew another conflict. But now, in retrospect, we can see the Cold War never really ended from the point of view of the American leadership. Uh, they wanted to surround Russia, and I think in the end, really to dismantle Russia even, uh, because there was a lot of talk about Russia further dividing up into uh, <laughs> uh, local regions and so forth. In any event, NATO expanded. This uh, revived the tensions and the conflict with Russia. But the real coup de grace in this was the intention to expand NATO all the way to Ukraine and Georgia. 
And anyone with even a modicum of history and an ability to look at a map could see that the deliberate intention of the U.S. strategist was to surround Russia in the Black Sea region. And it was a replay of the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856 that this would be the way to weaken Russia, uh, to prevent Russia from projecting its power in the Eastern Mediterranean or the Middle East. And this was pretty much declared by thinkers like uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1997. So this is uh, the essence of where this conflict came from. Uh, the United States kept pushing, 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 and then in 2014 started the war uh, with the uh, uh, regime change operation in which the U.S. actively participated and stoked the Maidan unrest uh, and then supported a, uh, a violent overthrow of the presidency of uh, Ukraine, President Viktor Yanukovych, who was trying to calm down and slow down things by saying that Ukraine would be neutral, an idea that was not acceptable to the U.S. strategists. So the U.S. strategists sided with the Russophobic right-wing forces in Ukraine uh, and uh, participated in a violent overthrow. Europe was pretty pathetic in this because uh, it just jumped right in. European Europe lost its uh, its identity in this because uh, there used to be a difference of Europe and NATO, but now there isn't. Uh, Brussels is first NATO and then only second uh, the European Union, and pretty much the EU is subordinate to NATO in practical terms right now. And in 2014, Europe got right behind the United States, right behind the new uh, post-coup government. And this is when the war started. Uh, Crimea was uh, uh, taken back into Russia uh, through uh, this referendum. The uh, two uh, uh, people's republics in the Donbass uh, uh, said that uh, they demanded uh, autonomy. <clears throat> we had the Minsk agreements that Europe failed to uh, uh, ensure and as or guarantee as they were supposed to, especially France and Germany, and uh, which uh, Ukraine just completely brushed off. And through all of this, the United States just kept sending weapons, arming uh, Ukraine, and uh, declaring at every opportunity that NATO would expand to Ukraine. Finally, uh, Putin, uh, on December 17th, 2021, uh, put on the table a draft security uh, arrangement between the US and Russia calling for an end to NATO enlargement, uh, an end to US unilateral missile emplacement such as the Aegis missiles in Poland and Romania, and uh, essentially uh, Ukrainian neutrality. The United States uh, flatly rejected negotiations on this. There's some weird idea which uh, Dutch politicians are uh, constantly uh, mouthing and it's absurd, let me say, absolutely absurd and destructive, the idea that Russia has no say in NATO enlargement. This is just our business. Well, Open door policy. That's, how, that, that's how you get to war. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's so obviously obnoxious and wrongheaded, that claim. That's how you get to war. And, and I wonder, is it like you described the attitudes of, of uh, the US over the past decades and just before the war, um, what, what were they thinking? Like, we're going to conquer, we're going we gonna to win, we're going to, I mean, didn't they? Of course. I mean, there were so many warnings that this could go very wrong, also for the US, not only for the Ukrainians, but also for the US. Like what? What? What were they thinking? Are they? Did they actively risk a fight, or were they betting on Putin? You know, uh, you know, sitting back and, and not acting. What? What's the attitude? In it, it's uh, this is a game of chicken, uh, and uh, it's a game that's played as a game, as they do the war games, uh, and uh, they constantly miscalculate. Uh, I don't find these people very bright, and I don't find them uh, very. 
much capable of analyzing the likely reactions on the other side or the rest of the world. But there's been a group that's been deeply engaged in this uh, since 2014 and even earlier. That's Victoria Newland, mm -hmm. who is our uh, Deputy Secretary of State. And it's amazing. She was Cheney's national, Deputy National Security Advisor, Republican, uh, right wing Cheney. Uh, then she was uh, Bush's. Uh, ambassador to NATO in 2008 when this commitment of uh, Ukraine's expansion came in. Then she was Assistant Secretary of State in 2014 uh, during the Maidan. She was the point person uh, in the Maidan uh, events and famously was caught on tape, uh, and <laughs> which everyone can listen to, of how she and the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine are planning who's going to be the next government several weeks before the violent overthrow. Just okay, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Extraordinary yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, but who is this group? This group was Biden. He was VP. Jake Sullivan, who was Biden's uh, national security advisor and still is today. Uh, Blinken uh, and Newland. So this group has uh, been, been around uh, in this uh, for the last nine years, they continue, obviously, uh, each has been promoted, uh, let's say, but they continue uh, <clears throat> this effort. Now, what do they think? They think at each stage, ah, we've got it made. We'll get through and Russia can't respond. So in 2014, they thought, well, this is going to be a, a U.S. regime change operation and uh, we'll get yaks in power and, and uh, what, what's Russia going to do? And uh, Putin... <laughs> called their bluff, said, okay, uh, Crimea is coming back to us. Uh, and then this uh, insurrection, or let's say just this uprising in, in the heavy ethnic Russian regions of Eastern Ukraine saying, we don't want to be part of this Russophobic regime that just came in through a coup. Uh, and uh, that was also unexpected by uh, the Americans. Okay, then what happened? Uh, well, the Americans thought, all we have to do is pump up arms, uh, keep uh, sending in the arms. Uh, Ukraine will take back uh, the territory uh, in any event of uh, this insurrection. What's Putin going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the U.S. will just keep declaring uh, territorial integrity, territorial integrity. Uh, and there was a lot of death in, in uh, the shelling by Ukraine uh, of uh, the Donbass. Um, the Minsk agreements came and went. And in 2021, I thought, Biden might bring in some kind of rationality, but he brought a new lid. <laughs> so he brought uh, even more uh, of this uh, and an escalation in 2021. Now, what did they think in the end of 2021? I spoke to the White House and I said, bargain, negotiate. Come on, these are reasonable terms. When Putin says don't expand NATO, that's not even a concession. That's just basic wisdom. And they no, 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 no. This is open door policy. Any country has the right. Russia has no say in this. Are you kidding? And then they said, don't worry. You know, Ukraine's not really going to be a member. This is a moot point. I said, if it's a moot point, say it and avoid a war. Of course, they didn't say it. What did they think? They thought Putin's bluffing. Hmm. OK, then the special military operations launched on February 24th. Then what did the Americans think? Ah. Now we've got them because uh, our economic sanctions uh, will shut down the Russian economy. We just have to disconnect the Russian economy from SWIFT, and this is uh, going to be decisive. Okay, this is uh, absurd in many ways. Anyone who knows the history of sanctions knows that that wasn't going to work by itself, but it worked even less in the case of Russia because the rest of the world continued to do business with Russia. And this was predictable because the rest of the world looks at this and says, U.S., could you calm down? Stop. You don't have to put NATO there. Hmm. That's how the rest of the world views this. So Europe's completely lost, by the way, its sense of the rest of the world. It's weird because yeah. Europe used to have some sense of uh, what was going on in the rest that, of the world. Do you understand why that's happening? So, like, why we're so much uh, more into submission than it, than it looked like to be before? the Europeans? I'll tell you, the biggest surprise of all of this uh, to me is uh, is Europe, uh, because Europe 
was the voice of sustainable development. Europe was the voice of, uh, of uh, non-military approaches. Europe was the voice of diplomacy, or so I thought. Hmm. And that's what I be, would have expected. There seems to be even some sort of competition. Like if I see to the Dutch, if we talk about the Dutch, our uh, Prime Minister Rutte seems to have been one of the drivers behind the, the delivery of the F-16 fighters, um, which is a major escalatory step. Don't you think so? So we even sort of competing for being in the in, in the in the good uh, the good book of the US somehow. I don't really understand it. One I can't name the person, but one leader in Europe said to me that the US treats European leaders like children. Mm. This is one thing that I've heard. Uh, an another thing that I've <coughs> I've seen myself is leaders in Europe tell me one thing privately and then say the pro NATO public thing. Uh, the, I, the, uh, I always wonder, are they? Why are we so afraid of the U.S.? What can they I really do? What I can don't they know. Really do? <laughs> I don't think they can do anything. I I really don't think they can do anything. Huh. I think this is wrong. Mm -hmm. I think Europe is uh, losing its way tremendously. Mm -hmm. I think it's deeply regrettable that NATO headquarters and European Commission headquarters are in the same uh, same city. This is a huge, huge, huge mistake. It's by design. This equate, <laughs> yeah, this equation of the EU and NATO is a profound damage to Europe, period. Because Europe had uh, the idea that uh, there should be European security arrangements, uh, OSCE. What a great idea, by the way, yeah. uh, a large group that would work things out on the basis of collective security. That's the Europe that we really need. That's safety for Europe. Because I know the United States, I tried to tell people, the US has been in constant war all over the world. Is it really Europe's desire to have US hegemony? Is that really Europe's well, so, interest or goal? So but that's America's goal. And it's not even a hidden goal. You just have to read the documents of the United States. Yeah. And is that really what Europe wants? Well, is sometimes that Macron the says the right things. You know? Sometimes Macron just says, you know, we shouldn't be following each war of the US, etc. But yeah. yeah, and then the next day, the opposite, by the way. That's a part of this whole weirdness right yeah. now. If I may ask you, eh, because we only have a short time, like how how bad is it? How deep are we? Because you 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 mentioned the neocons. You mentioned the the impunity by which the U.S. has has followed its course through the world over the past decades after the Second World War. They could start all these kinds of violent projects, and there's never been any repercussion. How far do you think the U.S. is now prepared to go in terms of escalation? And how far is my real worry? Are we on the route to a real World War III scenario? If European leaders would think and act in Europe's interests, we can pull back from the brink very, very quickly. All of this depends on the bandwagon effect, mm -hmm. meaning the US can't do anything if European leaders say, no, this is not safe, this isn't prudent. That's what this requires. Where are European leaders that understand all of this? Mm -hmm. And they do understand this. And I've spoken to them, and many in private understand this. And by the way, in 2008, as is very well known, when the United States said, Ukraine and Georgia will join NATO, it was the European leaders that said, what are you doing? Don't. That is a direct provocation. That is a Russian red line. Incidentally, the U.S. ambassador at the time, who is now our CIA director, William Burns, wrote a famous memo, which fortunately the American people got to see through WikiLeaks, because otherwise uh, the government keeps everything secret from us. But we got to see the memo entitled Niet means Niet, which explained that it's the entire Russian political class that absolutely fervently opposes NATO expanding to Ukraine and views it existentially, meaning don't do that with a nuclear power, superpower. And European leaders knew that. 
But even 2008, when they, I heard this privately then, but even then, they thought, no, we're not going to give a roadmap. We're not going to give a timeline. We're not going to uh, do something uh, um, so dangerous. The U.S. said, no, but we must commit in the Bucharest uh, uh, NATO uh, uh, communique that uh, Ukraine will be a member. And the Europeans said, okay, okay, we'll say they'll be a member, but no timeline. So concessions to the United States, as usual. Now it's much worse, by the way, because now we don't hear we do not hear europe saying this incidentally uh stoltenberg uh you know he did what we call the a, a washington gaffe which means when you tell a little bit of truth by accident because everything is so systematically lying hmm. but stoltenberg went to the european parliament and he said yeah this is a war over nato enlargement he said that he said that people go read this please and then he said, Russia demanded no, and they have nothing to do with this, said Stoltenberg. Mm. Are you kidding? Mm. How can you say that the American military alliance expanding to the 2,000 kilometer border with Russia, with American missile placements, with America unilaterally pulling out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty and placing missiles in Poland and in Romania and who know well where else do they want to place them that this isn't Russia's business come on so so this is could we pull back from the brink absolutely if some European voices just had the gumption to say you know this is not the Europe that is safe it's destroying the economy aside from that but, but it's it is absolutely dangerous hmm. and but one by one the european politicians have just oh don't make us say anything against the united states government it's it's weird it's, it's weird i find it also very weird and i wonder like what i'm happy to see your prime minister leave politics he's leaving because yeah. he has not been constructive in this yeah. at all no well absolutely not and um a strange thing is happening, like a lot of politicians are leaving the politics. I, we see a real exodus of people from parliament. We have elections coming up in November. So um, is there anything you would like to, to say to these, the current, the, the new politicians that, that are, are, are candidates for, for, for parliament and for the new government? What would you say to Dutch politicians? There are some, I, I know, that, that think like you, but maybe haven't expressed so clearly. I, I think that it's so obvious that this war was provoked by this U.S. delusion, I'll call it, of hegemony. Hmm. This is the first point. Let us recognize we're in a multipolar world and we don't want war. Hmm. And we should be avoiding war. And when war breaks out, we should be negotiating quickly an end to the war. And by the way, let us remember that Ukraine and Russia came close to an agreement in March 2022, weeks after the start of this special military operation, and the United States stopped it. Hmm. And people should understand, and it, it was even said by Naftali Bennett, the former prime minister of Israel, who was uh, somehow informally uh, part of that negotiating process he said why did the u.s stop it because they wanted to look strong vis-a-vis -vis china mm. can you imagine anything more bizarre than that i'm telling you politicians of the netherlands understand this hegemony goes goes to the head uh, this is so misguided mm. this approach of the united states and Europe is a lot smarter and has a lot more history, by the way, of disaster of war, uh, and then making peace and understanding the need for collective security. Mm -hmm. That's the genius of modern Europe. Why fall back into a US military alliance that was to defend against a Soviet Union that doesn't exist anymore but that instead decided that its purpose was to surround Russia and even threaten Russia's fundamental 
security interests. Could this possibly be the right approach? The answer is no. Mm. So uh, the U.S. has acted, I think, over the past decades, not really as an equal partner to anybody. No, it's, it looked like you know they could order countries around, like they're doing now in Europe, and they thought they could maybe do that also with Russia and China, etc. So, what would be needed in order to for the U.S. foreign foreign policy uh, establishment or the U U.S. establishment um, as a whole to in order to realize they they need to act as as just a country and not like the hegemon. What 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 what's needed for the U.S. to come to the table and start a, an honest dialogue about the future of humanity? What's happened in uh, this dreadful game of escalation with Russia is the U.S. and Europe have seen that the rest of the world did not fall into line. No. The rest of the world looked at this aghast and said, stop this war. And Europe should take some lessons from this. The rest of the world's not on side with the European Union. In fact, the European Union is basically losing its, uh, it, its, uh, it, its respect uh, mm -hmm. throughout the world mm -hmm. because of this. It's, uh, lo it's losing its economics because of this. It's losing uh, its, uh, the respect that many had around the world. But take the note that 80% of the world's population are in countries that are not on side where the government say, don't do this. So the first point is Europe should wake up to this reality. Europe's great strength is, quote, as a soft power, if you want to use those terms, as a place of astoundingly high living standards, a place that learned how to live together on a continental scale, a place that had, has the highest life expectancy in the world and, uh, uh, and uh, the commitment to green economy. And the whole world admired Europe for that, not for its NATO military, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so Europe should first understand that, that that's key. Now, if Europe got that understanding, the United States would say, oh my God, we really are alone in this. And some of us in the United States that are trying to save to our security state for years, you're, you're way out of date, you're anachronistic, you don't understand the world, which is, I've been trying to say this for years to Washington, they might get the message. But when Europe jumps in and says how wonderful the United States and uh, Putin evil and uh, there's no, this is unprovoked and, and so forth, it just feeds mm. the, the craziness yeah. uh, that comes out of this hegemonic idea. And by the way, it's going to Asia right now. I, I hope Europe understands the US is gonna provoke a war in with China the way we're going. And just as NATO members, are you kidding that NATO is going to open an office in Japan? Are you kidding? Last time I checked, NATO is North Atlantic Treaty Organization, not U.S. Expeditionary Force, not the Army of the Hegemon, not an East Asian military force. So have some sense and understand that this idea of the U.S., which you can find in every strategic document, that the U.S. must be uh, the primary power uh, in every region of the world, which is formal doctrine of the United States, is dangerous in a multipolar world. So finally, as, as a as sort of a last question, because I think for now, our politicians are very, very much on that course of following slavishly US pol policies. So I think there's a big task personally of, of ordinary people actually, but we see at the same time that this war comes at the moment that the peace movements, at least in Europe, are, are quite weak. At least in, I have to talk about the Netherlands because that's what I know. Um, so I think there's a big task also for society, for, for ordinary people who are worried about what's going on. Um, do you believe in, in the power of, of citizens and how, how do you think what we should do? And do you see, do you, do you have some optimism in that sense? Of, of course, we have to 
believe in the power of citizens and we have to believe in the power of rationality and we have to believe in the power of evidence. So we need to understand the history of this, uncover the background because our mainstream media collapsed on us, mm -hmm. uh, refused to tell any of the stories, cancel culture, can't even get absolute evidence uh, into, uh, in, into the mainstream media. But what we also have right now we have a bloodbath going on in Ukraine because we push the Ukrainians to fight on, fight on. You think sending them more weapons is helping Ukraine defeat Russia? No, it's helping, as they say, to fight to the last Ukrainian. Hmm. So for anyone that cares about the Ukrainian people, stop the bloodbath. Hmm. Negotiate. Yes. This is the basic point. And we see from this failed counteroffensive, predictably failed, mm, yes. there is no military defeat of Russia mm. with its 6,000 nuclear warheads in any event. Mm. And so it's time to save Ukraine mm. by really saving Ukraine mm. as a neutral country in which both sides back off that's what was feasible on the table. We need to return to the negotiating table. So that should be our call to our politicians. The goal should be back to negotiations, which were actually going to succeed in March 2022 before the United States stopped them. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is the time we have, uh, unless you want to add something else. Uh, no, no, this this is, uh, thank you so much. Thank, Thanks thank you for- much. And I, I just wanted to say that, um, again, I'm very happy that you are such a mainstream voice and such a very, someone who can reach out to millions, that you are joining this uh, this movement. And I hope we really can build a movement together. Like across- Well, count on me. And uh, I hope we can continue to work together to, to promote- yeah, Let's do that, absolutely. Thank Great you very work. Much. Th thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.